Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today we'll be talking remotely with Dr. Walter Short. Dr. Short is a hand surgeon who practices hand surgery at the SOS Hand and Wrist Surgery Center at the Syracuse Orthopedic Specialist in Syracuse, New York. Dr. Short is a recognized leader in the field of orthopedic hand surgery, publishing over 200 articles and scholarly presentations and receiving numerous research grants from the federal government while serving as a professor at Upstate Medical University. He's also recognized for premier patient care, having received a National Patient's Choice Award for three consecutive years and a five-star rating by Health Grades. Dr. Short attended medical school at Upstate Medical University, followed by a general surgery internship at the University of Connecticut and a surgical orthopedic residency at Upstate Medical University. Dr. Short continued his education with a hand fellowship at Yale University and the University of Connecticut. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Short. Thank you for having me today. Dr. Short, what I thought we would talk about uh, over the next few minutes is, is a procedure, um, which is not a very common procedure, uh, but it's an artificial wrist joint. And I understand as a hand and wrist surgeon that uh, this is something that, that hand and wrist surgeons typically do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, perhaps what disease processes are appropriate and may lead a patient to need an artificial wrist joint. Uh, wrist uh, replacement is not as advanced as uh, total knees and total hips. Uh, but it has come a long way in the past uh, 20 to 25 years. The majority of people that I see that need a total wrist replacement are people that have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, what happens is that uh, the disease process weakens the ligaments, it erodes the uh, cartilage on the bone, and uh, these uh, people um, have pain, uh, diminished function, and uh, loss of motion uh, in the wrist uh, that makes it so that they want something done. Uh, unfortunately, in people that have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it involves multiple joints. So uh, it would be nice in, uh, to offer them a surgical procedure that maintains some mobility and diminishes their pain and uh, maintains their function because they have multiple joints involved and therefore uh, if, you, if you fuse all of these joints, their, their function will be greatly hindered, hindered because of that. Well, you know, it's interesting. Why, why do you think it is that wrist arthroplasty has not been the focus um, as much as hip arthroplasty and knee arthroplasty. You know, we've, we've pretty much, I would say, mastered those, those um, artificial joints to the point where they're very successful. Now, it's not saying that they won't continue to improve, but they are so much more successful and so much more commonplace than a joint such as the wrist uh, in terms of an artificial joint. Why do you think that is? I think there's a lot more people that have uh, arthritic conditions of the hip and knee uh, uh, a total uh, uh, joint replacement or arthroplasty uh, initially got its start by replacing the hip joint. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some financial incentive uh, for hips and knees because there's many, many more of those uh, being done. So uh, for companies that make artificial joints, uh, their research and development goes toward uh, uh, the joints or the uh, anatomical areas where there's more of them to be done and uh, started in the hip. So that's where the research uh, sort of uh, started its focus and was in hips and knees. That's not to say that uh, uh, the um, uh, indications for wrist replacement it can't uh, continue to expand as we get better prostheses and better uh, joint replacements. And I think a, a lot of uh, advancement has come in the past 10 to 15 years as far as uh, gaining ground on uh, total hips and total knees. So uh, we aren't there to the stage where a total hip and total knee is, 
but we are uh, gaining ground uh, um, every year, I think. You know, for a long time, I think orthopedic surgeons have always considered the hip and the knee to be simpler joints than the wrist, and the wrist being a very complex sort of joint and reproducing what our wrist does may be more difficult than the hip and the knee. Do you, do you really believe that that's the case, or do you think that it's just we haven't focused enough on trying to refine the implants for the, the wrist to the point to, to where they can function as, as good as the hip and the knee? I, I think it's a combination of uh, both factors. I think uh, uh, since there are less uh, uh, risks uh, being done, less, uh, less research is being done uh, on that particular procedure, uh, and I also think uh, the wrist joint is uh, uh, somewhat more complex uh, than the uh, hip and the knee. Uh, it's uh, that complexity uh, certainly can be overcome, and we can engineer joints that mimic the uh, function and uh, motion of the wrist. So uh, I think it's a matter of uh, uh, of uh, uh, focusing. Uh, our research on developing uh, a wrist uh, that is stable, uh, allows motion, and can be used uh, uh, for uh, some more indications. You know, it's interesting. I think that, that when we sit down and have discussions with patients, sometimes we, we tend to um, try to guide that patient in terms of making the right choice. For a, for a long time, and I think you've alluded to the fact that in the rheumatoid patient, the choice really boils down to a fusion of the wrist, giving up um, the motion to attain strength versus the artificial joint, which preserves motion and, and may or may not give up strength. When you sit down with a patient to have this discussion, how do you, how do you have that discussion with the patient in terms of the risk and the benefits of both of these procedures? Uh, I think I uh, talk to the patient and ask them what their expectations are. If uh, the patient has expectations that he's going to uh, do a manual labor, he's going to be involved in uh, some sort of contact sports, he's going to uh, go back and do heavy lifting, uh, I tell a patient that uh, uh, we haven't advanced enough to give him a prosthesis or a joint that is going to withstand uh, those rigors and that he might be better served uh, with a wrist fusion. Either that or alter his lifestyle and uh, maintain some of his wrist, uh, wrist motion. Uh, another patient that has uh, uh, arthritis or has multiple joints involved uh, and uh, say both wrists are um, uh, uh, arthritic, then I would advise uh, the patient to have a wrist replacement uh, because um, uh, they are going to need to maintain as much mobility as they have, knowing that in the future uh, that the mobility in other joints is going to diminish. So if you can maintain the motion at least one joint, that uh, uh, is a very uh, satisfactory to the patient and they are uh, very grateful that you've maintained at least some motion so that they can do activities which they couldn't ever possibly do with two fused wrists. Yeah, you know, it used to be a rule of thumb when I was going through training that if you were faced with a situation with a rheumatoid uh, a patient that, that two wrist fusions really uh, disables those patients because especially for personal hygiene, if you think about it, it's very difficult to wash and, and cleanse yourself when you have two stiff wrists. So um, the, the rule of thumb was always if you're, if you're talking to those patients, uh, you need to consider one fusion for strength and one artificial joint or some other procedure that maintains motion. Is that still in the hand surgery world a rule of thumb or, uh, or not? Uh, in my experience, um, it, once I, if, if both wrists are, are arthritic and I do one wrist replacement, it's very hard to convince them to do a wrist fusion on the opposite side. Uh, uh, 
especially for people that are willing to modify their activities at least somewhat uh, so that uh, the uh, longevity of the uh, wrist replacement is extended uh, to some degree. Uh, uh, my experience with patients that I have seen that have had uh, both wrists fused is that they are uh, uh, not very happy and somewhat miserable because there's a lot of activities that they just can't do. They need one wrist to bend to uh, survive in this society. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think you're right. You know, it's it's that goes back to the same thing that, that 30 years ago you could see with hip replacements and even knee replacements. I mean, I, I think we're both of the same age where um, one of the procedures for knee arthritis and hip arthritis in the young patient was a fusion, whether it was the knee or the hip. And it was very difficult after a pa to get patients to agree to that once the, the knee replacement was reasonable in terms of its success and the hip replacement. And, and today, no one would even consider uh, you know, making that the, the first choice for a patient, uh, let's say in their 40s, that um, um, needs some sort of a procedure. And, and 30 years ago, it was very common to essentially tell a 40-year-old patient that, that they were not a candidate for a total knee replacement and they, they would have to have a fusion. Um, and I think, as you, as you pointed out, it seems like that with the wrist, we're getting to that point to where um, both patients and physicians are a little bit loath to, to fuse the wrist if, if they can provide them with motion. Um, except in very special circumstances. I would agree completely. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, certainly uh, in, 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 I would uh, expect in the next 20, 15, 20 years, uh, a wrist replacement will be a, a much more common operation because the indications will expand so that people that have arthritis in uh, a portion of the wrist instead of having partial wrist fusions, we'll have uh, wrist replacements. I think that the technology and uh, the uh, durability of uh, the newer models of wrist replacements will uh, broaden the indications for a wrist replacement. Well, if you could, go, with, go through with us a little bit about the current technology of wrist replacement and, and and in some ways, tell us a little bit about what's done when you replace a wrist. What type of procedures are done and what are you replacing the wrist joint with? To give a little history, uh, the, some of the first uh, wrist replacements were basically uh, flexible pieces of rubber that uh, they uh, put in between the radius, which is the long bone in your forearm, and uh, the small little wrist bones, uh, the carpal bones. Uh, these worked for a short period of time, but uh, quickly either broke uh, or uh, started to fragment and caused uh, reactions in the body. Uh, then uh, the wrist replacements uh, started to uh, become more like uh, hip and knee replacements uh, where uh, the components were metal, and uh, on one of the metal components, uh, it was uh, had a uh, polyethylene or a plastic cap, and what that did was make a almost frictionless surface between the metal and the plastic, so that there were uh, there was allowed more motion. The trouble with some of these early prostheses is that. Uh, they became loose very quickly, especially the part that stuck into the hand and the wrist area. And uh, now we have developed uh, a different technology so that uh, the surface of the uh, wrist itself that goes inside the bone is roughened so that there is uh, ingrowth of bone into the uh, components so it uh, doesn't loosen as frequently. Uh, and there's still a, a plastic component interposed so that uh, the gliding is a lot easier. So at least with this newer uh, technology, uh, the uh, uh, 
components seem to last longer, they're more durable, uh, there's more indications as to when to use them, uh, they come in a lot of different sizes and are adaptable for the deformities uh, that we see uh, commonly and uh, less commonly. Now, the operation itself, is this an inpatient operation or, or can you do an outpatient uh, wrist arthroplasty these days? The majority of uh, people usually stay overnight. So one night in the hospital? Correct. They come in the day of their surgery and they go home the next day. And the post-operative course, how long is it before you feel like that patients can pretty much do as they please with the, the artificial wrist w within limitations? Uh, the post-operative course is uh, they're uh, immobilized uh, somewhere between four and six weeks, either in a splint or a cast. Uh, and that is to um, allow the soft tissues to heal and to help restabilize the wrist itself. Because initially, after the surgery, uh, the components are somewhat unstable, and if you don't protect them, you have a somewhat higher chance of the uh, total wrist components dislocating. So usually they're in a cast for somewhere around four to six weeks. After that, the cast is removed, they are put in a splint, and then they are sent to physical therapy to uh, start to regain the motion. Uh, the expected uh, results are that they will have uh, some motion. They, will ha they don't have uh, normal motion, and typically it's about uh, a third to a half of normal motion. And what about strength? How, how, how does that compare to, um, for example, a wrist fusion or maybe the normal situation? Do you lose strength in the grip and in the hand when you uh, uh, do an artificial wrist joint? Uh, I don't think you lose strength, but uh, you don't gain a lot of strength either. You gain, well, you, you gain a little bit of strength because there's no pain so that they, so the, the patient can do more. But I, in my experience, people that have wrist re replacement compared to people that have wrist fusion, uh, the people that have wrist replacements have somewhat less strength compared to the people that have wrist fusion. But uh, when asked, they would much prefer to have the motion than the strength. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Um, in terms of complications, what do you worry about with the artificial wrist replacement, you know, both at the time of, of surgery and in the immediate post-operative period, and then what are the long-term complications of a, of a wrist replacement? Uh, the short-term complications are uh, an infection. A lot of people that have rheumatoid arthritis are on very potent uh, medications, which uh, uh, decrease their immune uh, response. Uh, they also can uh, dislocate, meaning the components aren't uh, lined up correctly. Uh, uh, the components can loosen because the bone in some people that have rheumatoid arthritis or some other arthritic conditions um, uh, makes it so that they, the, the, these metal components can loosen. Uh, later on, uh, I still worry about uh, the uh, instability in the wrist, and uh, I still worry about infection, especially in rheumatoids because of the medications they're on. Uh, but the major concern later on is loosening of the components. Uh, the in people that have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the disease process goes on, they get other deformities, the bone continues to uh, weaken, and uh, this in the future may cause loosening. The newer processes, however, uh, do incorporate a technology where we try to get bone to grow into the components so that this won't happen as frequently, and I, I think uh, we're starting to see some of the uh, uh, success from this newer technology. Well, it seems like, you know, we worry about wear of the actual plastic and the metal components in the hip and the knee because they're weight-bearing. I'm assuming that that's not a big concern in the wrist since this isn't a real weight-bearing joint and, and the plastic and the metal, for that matter, is not under quite as much stress as the hip and the knee. Is that, is that accurate? That, that's, uh, that's accurate. Uh, uh, wear 
is not uh, uh, the, the big issue. Loosening is the big issue in, in these people. And, and what are you expecting today when you put in a, an artificial wrist, wrist joint? What do you tell people in terms of how long this will last uh, before it has to be replaced uh, or a revision done or some other type of procedure done? Are you expecting these to last for the rest of their lives? Uh, I think if they are uh, 60, 70, uh, and uh, they um, are uh, conscientious about their activity level, then I think that that, that, that prosthesis or that uh, wrist replacement should last the rest of their life. If they're 50, uh, 60, uh, they think that they're going to be playing uh, golf or go skiing every day, then it's not going to last the rest of their life. I, I, it's sort of like a, a, a tire or a, a new car. It has so many, it has X number of miles on it. When you when the miles are up, it starts to wear out. And are you more concerned? I mean, are you are you recommending artificial uh, wrist joints for things other than rheumatoid disease? For example, you know, we we've talked in the past about. Uh, uh, both non-union of the scaphoid. We've also talked about Kienbach's disease where patients may develop an advanced osteoarthritis. So they may be in normal health, they may be very active, and yet they have an arthritic risk. Are you suggesting that those people are now candidates for an artificial joint? I think that if somebody has uh, uh, arthritis throughout their wrist and uh, is facing either a wrist fusion and is willing to alter their lifestyle that they may be that that they could be a candidate for risk replacement as opposed to a risk fusion but they have to realize that uh, uh, they're going to have to be a little bit more delicate uh, with a, uh, a risk replacement than they would with a risk fusion so things like you mentioned, skiing, racket sports, golf, those things are not doable with a wrist fusion or a wrist uh, arthroplasty in this day and age? Or, or do people actually do those activities uh, with a wrist uh, replacement in place? I'm sure that they do that, but they probably don't tell their doctor that they do it. <laughs> I see what you mean. Well, I think this has been an excellent discussion about artificial wrist uh, replacement, and I think that, that it has come a long way in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, you know, this was just a procedure during my training in my early career that uh, was not considered a, a viable uh, option. And I, I can still remember seeing uh, some of those rubber artificial uh, wrist joints uh, put in at, at the early stages of my career. So uh, we have come a long way, and I want to thank you for sharing this information. Is there anything else that you think that patients should know before we close this discussion today? Well, I, I think that they, uh, somebody with ha that has uh, uh, severe arthritis of the wrist need to know what the, the options available to them. And uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, some of these people have heard that wrist replacement isn't good. It's, you know, it doesn't last. And uh, I think uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, they would have been right. But uh, technology advances and uh, times change. And I think uh, they need to be apprised of the fact that there are things out there that may allow them, some, may allow them motion uh, if, they're living, if they're willing to live within uh, some boundaries as far as uh, uh, strenuous activities. Well, good advice, and I think if, if we see as much um, advance over the next 20 years as we've seen in the last 20 years with, with wrist uh, replacement, uh, it may be that it, it begins to rival the, the success of the hip and the knee and, and some of the other joints like the ankle and the elbow. So I, I look forward to sort of following that progress with you. So thanks today for sharing this. Well, thank you very much.